this is a, just an anarchistic uh, Q&A. Uh, I'm going to just be the, the moderate moderator and pick on people. And we have a, a mic over here. So if you, you want to uh, ask a question, raise your hand, and uh, we'll give you. He'll, responsibility. he'll pass it around. Where's the thing that you throw at people? Then you have that, that. Okay. Okay. So you can ask any questions to any of the today's speakers. Uh, uh, yes, sir. You had your hand up first. I have a question for Dr. Klein. Uh, I was wondering, with, with with big tech, do you think there's there's an exact point where we can draw the line with data collection? I know you talked about you know they're, they're collecting basic data. You know things that you are interested in for advertisers to target you and then give you those specified advertisements. Where do you, where do you draw the line with that? Um, and also, if we continue in this path in the future, we've seen you know, big, big tech firms and, and companies like, like MySpace going out of business, but if we continue in, the, in, in, this, in, in this way in, in the mixed market the US has, do you think that big tech could even grow dangerous in the future? Well, on the first question, I'm not, I'm not sure I completely understand where you're, what you're sort of getting at, but I think all of these data collection issues are really contractual questions, right? So, you know, when you sign up for the service, there's typically some kind of user agreement in, in which some sort of data disclosure policies are provided. So, I mean, in principle, right, if those were all considered enforceable contracts and the courts have ruled in many cases that they're not enforceable contracts, you know, then, then the issue of what information can be collected by the platform and how that information can be used would be determined by that contract. There was a case, for example, uh, it was last year, two years ago, where um, uh, so, some uh, Facebook data was was sold to a third party in violation of uh, the user agreement. And so, you know, if, or if um, there are lots of uh, cases where various uh, retail stores, it happened to Target here a few years ago, it's happened to several retailers, you know, hackers broke in and got people's credit card information or something like that, right? So if, if, if a store voluntarily gave up personal information that, that, I had not agreed to disclose, then that would potentially be a breach of contract, right? Not necessarily a criminal act, but I would have a civil case for breach of contract. What makes it complicated is that uh, courts have ruled in some cases that, you know, those click-through licenses, which you don't read, right? You want to install the thing or create an account, click, 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 now I'm done. You know, you just click that you consented to this, you consented to that, are those considered enforceable agreements or not? I mean, that's sort of a question that in a free market, a libertarian legal system would have to work out. So, I mean, to me, it's not like a volume issue. Well, if they collect only a certain amount of data, it falls under one set of rules, but if they collect a larger quantity of data, it's different. To me, it's sort of the same thing, that the way we want that system to work is that the contract governs what can be collected and how it can be used. And I mean, as for the second question, I mean, I don't know, we'll have to sort of wait and see what happens. I mean, can I imagine a world in which even in the absence of government intervention, you know, we care so much about access to some gadget, you know, somebody inv invents a flying car or a teleportation device but to use it, you have to sign this really restrictive contract that, you know, they can take your kids when they turn 18. I, you know, some people might do that and then later sort of wish they hadn't. Uh, one thing that's interesting, and I talked about this um, last year when I did a, a talk on uh, specifically on privacy. You know, there are a lot of privacy-enhancing alternatives. Like, you know, you can use DuckDuckGo and a, a non-Google you know, in a browser other than Chrome, and less of your information will be collected than if you use Chrome and Google search, but only a tiny, tiny percentage of people are willing to do that. You can encrypt all your emails, you can encrypt all of your texts and so forth, but most people, when they evaluate that trade-off, it's not worth it. I mean, most people, they've revealed through their actions that they're not willing to sacrifice a little bit of convenience 
or presumed accuracy in search results to have more privacy. So, you know, it wouldn't shock me if we sort of give up more of what many of us would consider to be our sort of, you know, rights to privacy and so forth, because that's a price we're willing to pay to get other benefits of technology. But we just have to wait and see how this plays out in the market. Um, let's go in the back of the room, the, way in the back. <laughs> we tend to ignore the people in the back, us, us old guys, because we can't see that. Hello, uh, this so is I, for, I, I could just barely make them out, though. This is for you, Dr. Lorenzo, and also anybody on the panel who, who has an idea on this. I was talking to a couple of my colleagues yesterday about my interest in writing a paper that I was going to title In Reluctant Defense of Cancel Culture and Deplatforming. And we got into this big argument about, you know, is it right for Twitter to deplatform people? Is it right for schools to deplatform people? And I came up and I said, you know, if students choose not to want somebody to talk to them, they have the right to do that. It's their graduation. Um, it doesn't matter what the idea is. And my question basically is, is it where, you know, we talk about, uh, my my, my um, argument was if you do not, you know, violate the non-aggression principle, you have the right to not talk to people or not want people to talk to you. Is that, do we, because the other alternative to me seems to be, you know, um, um, laws, because there's some bad behaviors that we don't like or that we think are not okay in society. And we usually either ostracize people or talk to people in our own personal lives to basically punish those um, ideas or bad behaviors that would be completely ridiculous and probably immoral if we say, go to prison for saying this. Isn't that a less cost, you know, a more effective way of punishing ideas of people we don't like? I want to get your thoughts on that because I'm you know, you were talking about how Twitter could stop people from their platform and that, you know, might not be a bad thing. I, I just wanted to uh, get your thoughts on if you don't break the non-aggression principle, don't you have the right to um, deplatform people if you wanted to? What is what is wrong with that, basically? Okay, well, he was asking me. Um, well, you know, we, if you have, if you believe that freedom of association is a good thing, then freedom of disassociation is just as good. You know, you, you know, you don't have, we don't have forced association, although uh, uh, the government tries to f force us to associate with with people we may not want to associate with, and and vice versa, it tries to disassociate with us with people who uh, believe in ideas like I do, for example. And and, uh, and the problem I have with uh, the deep platforming, so called, is that uh, I think Facebook and some of these other and Google are just too too much in bed with the NSA and the CIA and and, and, the, and the whole spying apparatus of the government, and are doing their spying for them. I think a lot of what they do is the the government knows it's unconstitutional to, to you know, they're breaking the First Amendment. What they're doing. But then the, they, they make the argument that, well, it's not the government that is doing this. It's a private company. It's Google. But they work hand in hand with Google. I mean, it's been all over the news that uh, the Biden administration and Facebook are, have their heads together to, you know, trying to determine who to censor next. And so you have sort of these uh, de facto fascist organizations like Google and Facebook who are, who are doing the government's dirty work for them. And so it's, it's that's just the way I see it as of right now, and I, I don't I don't consider them to be uh, you know purely private organizations anymore. Once once they're in the same room, you know what you know years ago I did a consulting project for Coca Cola, and when I had a meeting with some of the Coca Cola executives, uh, they had uh, there were people from Pepsi in the same room, and we all had to sign this this legal document. Uh, saying that we did not conspire to fix prices just because uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi executives happen to be in the same room. But now you have the, uh, the White House people and Facebook in the same room conspiring against all the, all the rest of society. And there's no lawyer in there saying, oh, you better sign this, uh, Joe Biden, to make sure uh, you know, you're, you're on the up and up and you're not breaking the First Amendment here. And so they, they, they're lawless. They can do whatever they want in that, in that situation. And anyway, that's the way I see it. I don't know if Peter wants to add. This is Peter's well, just, area. Just a brief comment. I mean, I agree with, with, with what Thomas said, but Tam, I think your question, 
You know, when people use the phrase cancel culture, sometimes they mean sort of the legal and political aspects. Sometimes they mean the social, cultural, communitarian aspects. I mean, I would say that, um, you know, I, I don't want to be the kind of person who, you know, if somebody hurts my feelings or rubs me the wrong way or says something I disagree with, I will shun them forever never have another conversation with them. I mean, I wouldn't be able to talk to any of these guys if that were the, <laughs> that were the case. But, uh, you know, independent of the legal and political issues, um, it, is it a good thing that we live in a society in which, you know, this sort of bullying or calling people out, uh, not, not exercising any forgiveness or forcing people to make these ritual apologies for this horrible thing I said? I, no, I don't think that's good from a social and cultural point of view, independent of the, you know, the, the legal issues. Uh, how about the, you right there? Yeah. <laughs> My question is for Dr. Gordon, and it is about uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe's view. Um, I can't remember if you specifically went in on it in your lecture, but um, it's about his view on monarchy and why it is preferable to democracy. Um, even though it's not the preferable option. Um, and he mentions that most of it comes from the fact that the monarch owns the country, so he has a, um, low, he has a lower time preference than other leaders and is uh, encouraged to not uh, pillage all the country's resources in a small amount of time because he can pass on leadership to his children. Uh, would this kind of philosophy also apply to an oligarchy that also came off the same principles of that you kind of divide up the country among a group of leaders who also own that specific part of the country and then also pass it on to their children. Would this same concept apply? Or is there something specifically about there being one leader of a nation that is making this principle uh, hold out? Uh, yes, I think that's a very good question you, you ask, it's, it would sound to me like the argument would apply to an oligarchy, but I should say in the way I presented the argument, at least I hope I presented, I didn't say that the monarch uh, has an uh, advantage because he owns the country. That is something Hans does suggest, but I, I gave the argument without that because I just mentioned that the monarch expects to be around for quite some time. And the reason I did that is one could possibly object. I don't say, try to assess the validity of the subject. Uh, one could say, well, uh, the monarch owns only his own estate, not the whole country. So I wanted to avoid that point, so that was why I didn't state the argument that way. But I think your point about olig oligarchy is a good one, and it would apply to my version of the argument also. By the way, guys, hold the mic closer to your face, because David, you went farther and farther away as you were talking. Oh, <laughs> like, well, and that, like that's this. why the... That was the better part of you had them all, <laughs> They were all sitting on the edges of their seats at the end of your, your comments. So another question, yes, right here. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Uh, DiLorenzo. So you talked about numerous like riots and protests led by college students against visiting speakers whom they happen to disagree with. Um, it's kind of a simple question, but how would you suggest that we talk to people who refuse to listen to any argument opposing socialism and just seem to prefer violence over discussion. How do you, how do you talk to people who, who prefer, like, violence don't want oh, oh, violence. You call the cops, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> on, the, on them. If they're perpetrating violence, that's what they would do. I gave a talk uh, a, couple, a couple years ago now at a large community college in North Carolina in the, and it was on capitalism. And I get there, and, uh, and uh, you know, some of the left, couple of the left wing faculty knew that I was coming. And so they, they started raising all kind of trouble online. And I get there, and my host, who invited me, said that she, she had to have like three or four extra campus cops around. 
you know, not not that they feared that I would. Well, what am I going to do? You know, but you know that's the thing, that's the way they, they were, and so I don't, I don't I don't know these people are not worth dealing with. I mean, you can't you're not going to convince everybody or persuade everybody. So for uh, my my advice is to forget about it as far as those are concerned, or work one on one. You know, I was telling some of the some people today that uh, years ago. Um, undergraduate economic students of mine were telling me things like, you know, we totally understand the argument against the minimum wage laws and things like this, but then when we go back to the dorm, our students give us, uh, our classmates give us a hard time, you know, the sociology major or the education major that's in in the same dorm because they're, they're sort of brainwashed in this idea that uh, uh, poor people have a problem, government is the solution, and they don't want to hear it. They don't want to, and so so they were fearful that they would have a bad social life on campus if they espoused economic sanity, whereas they're supposed to be e- economic stupidity is the sort of the the the, the uh, requisite thing to have a good social life on on the campus, at least where I worked at the time. And so they were hesitant to to do what you're suggesting and try to you know have a civilized discussion. But you have to pick you have to pick your targets, people who you think are would be uh, a little more reasonable, but the ones who would you know are borderline joining Antifa and in, in setting fires to buildings, uh, just call the cops on them. I, I, I wouldn't waste my time on them. You wanna you wanna devote your time to where you think you could have some impact on people. And that's you have to use your imagination how to do it. Our friend Tom Woods is the real genius at that in, in, in sort of persuasive uh, language. And so and we all have to work on that. <clears throat> when I was your age, when I was taking economics, I ran across The Freeman, the magazine The Freeman, in a classroom when I was a freshman in college. And I started reading uh, some of the great libertarian writers, including Mises, who had written in, in there. And I started working as a freshman on... Uh, persuasive writing, I, st- I started trying to imitate their methods and their techniques for, uh, of explaining economic ideas to, a, to the general audience. And so that's something that all of you can, can work on and, uh, and get better at and, uh, and, and as, you, as you go you know, through your college years. Uh, one, uh, when you're talking about violence and speech, it reminded me of a story about the great uh, Irish playwright, George Bernard Shaw. Uh, He once started a lecture by saying, uh, gentlemen, I'm a socialist, an atheist, and a vegetarian. And someone yelled out, three good reasons why you should be thrown out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, ridicule sometimes works. Uh, How about... uh, Yes, sir. How about this man right here? Make it easy on the guy passing the microphone around. Uh, Hello, all. Uh, I have a question for David Gordon about uh, the argumentation ethics. So uh, I'm a debater. I debate a lot. And one thing that I've noticed a lot in people is is when they seem to be almost pretending to have a debate or pretending to have an argument. And I say pretend because so often people aren't like they aren't arguing, they're just sort of repeating words and phrases that they've heard uh, or they've seen on the internet or that they've heard from, uh, from other people. Uh, so my question is, does owning, your, uh, owning oneself necessitate owning your own language? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, I should say. I'm rather sure I'm not understanding <laughs> the question. Uh, I think when we talk about own your language, I think, uh, do you mean in the sense some people use the term own now to mean something like be responsible for or to mean sincerely, or, you, or do you mean something like ownership in the sense that you're claiming that certain parts of the language belong to you. I'm taking you to mean more the former. Sort of, I guess, what just, um, because I mean, if you're just, if you're merely repeating these words, you're not speaking them uh, because you understand them. You're Mm -hmm. just, it's like you've adopted somebody else's, uh, somebody else's words. So I guess it's like somebody gave you uh, a set of clothes that you wear 
it's you don't exactly own them they're not yours but you still you are adopting them as if they were uh, your own I, I see I think I understand what you mean now unfortunately uh, <laughs> I, I would say that uh, that's that's not a condition for argument at all what the person's motives are what his thoughts about what he he's saying are really not relevant to evaluating what uh, the validity or otherwise of what he says. Uh, I remember there was a rather bad argument I've seen in print where someone has said, uh, uh, if someone is a liar, you can't trust what they're saying because say they say something, I mean, if they're even they're making a, uh, an assertion about some philosophical point, if they're, if they're known, if say they don't believe in objective truth, maybe they're lying, but that doesn't matter what is, you can evaluate what they're saying independent of whether they mean it or not, maybe they, they're, they, they're lying, they think what they're saying is false, but it could be true doesn't, so I would say uh, the motives or people have in whether they're uh, intend, whether they're just repeating what other people say or their sincerity really has very little to do with the, how uh, correct their ideas are. Okay, we'll go back to this side. How about um, this gentleman right here? He has had his hand up on the end there. Hi, this is for any of you. Um, can you help me distinguish the difference between, if any, between these two scenarios? So we've talked a little about cancel culture, but I think we also agree that people vote um, just by making a choice to frequent one place or another. So how does any of the conversation of can cancel culture, how does it affect that? So suppose you have a business owner and uh, he makes some bad statements or acts in a way you don't like and you choose to not frequent his business. How does that differ from what goes on with cancel culture, which seems theoretically to be the exact same concept, except that individual is marketing your views publicly to other people. So can you differentiate between those two and does anyone have a problem with cancel culture and if so, why? From that perspective. If I understand correctly, you mean, um if I offer some kind of uh, digital product to you, a communications platform or email service, and you say things on that email service that offend me, and I want to restrict your use of my service because you've violated some social mores, I mean, is that what you're asking? Is that, you're saying, would that be an example of cancel culture? For, for, any, for any reason, really. Any, anything that yeah. someone yeah, but again, I mean, it's it's a question of what what does the contract say? I mean, if if you've paid for a one year subscription and there's nothing in the language that restricts your ability to say X, and then you say X and I cancel your subscription, then you could you know then you have a potential claim against me for violating the contract. Um, it'd be no different from a you know retail store if, if Walmart says we don't want people with you know bow ties to come in. And they throw uh, Sean Rittenauer out. <laughs> I, I wouldn't call that cancel culture. I mean, that's just, like, like Tom said, that's just uh, the commercial context of exercising your right to not associate with someone for, for any reason, unless you previously agreed that you would, and now you're breaking a prior agreement. Uh, I don't see any reason to object to that. Where would Sean get his bow ties if Walmart didn't sell them? Oh, well, like <laughs> 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 you <take> My mother. <laughs> <laughs> she works at Sam's. <laughs> uh, uh, nobody on this side. Uh, how about Marcus had his hand up? Uh, Here you go, Marcus. Okay. I called on him because I wanted everybody to see his suit that he's wearing. He has a date tonight. He's yeah. all, all trusted. <laughs> all right. So this, 
<laughs> this question is for Dr. Lorenzo, Dr. Klein, also to an extent Dr. Gordon, even Dr. Terrell. Okay, so. Uh, so, Dr. Klein, you can take this as just me saying the code words, talk about Section 230, but what do you think of this as like a nuclear option on cancel culture? So, even if we don't say that Facebook is a public company, it certainly is a public accommodation by most measures. And from my understanding, the legal argument for the Civil Rights Act was that any public accommodation could not discriminate based on certain categories because to do so, even as a private organization, would compromise the 14th Amendment, equal protection. That was incorporated not only the federal government, but to the states, and therefore to any, cover, any entity that contracted with the state. So couldn't we just use, again, as a nuclear option, the Civil Rights Act of 1964? and say that any firm that, that plans on trafficking in human language has to adhere to the same free speech standards that the government does, that Facebook needs to give me the same free speech protections that the state does in the same way that, according to one of our favorite laws, any company, for example, Walmart, cannot discriminate against me from walking the door for being black because it is a public accommodation. Or we can talk about Section 230. Feel free to take like 15 seconds before you answer my question on the Civil Rights Act. <laughs> was that for Peter? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but fortunately we have some in the building today who <laughs> perhaps could address whether that would work. I mean, the, the, the platforms claim that, uh, the, the, that they're exercising their rights to restrict access based on violations of the terms of service, the so-called community standards. I mean, would a constitutional case claiming that enforcing the community standards violates uh, the relevant part of the Civil Rights Act. I have no idea if that would work. Well, I think the, the, uh, you know, the Civil Rights Act applies to uh, discrimination on race, creed, national origin, and that, that sort of thing, doesn't it? So, so uh, I wouldn't think it would apply. They're, they're, I mean, you'd have to argue that the thing that they kicked you out for was a so-called protected class. Yeah as interpreted by, you know, and the Supreme Court has recently expanded the def definition of protected class, but, you know, libertarian would not, would not, <laughs> it's not one. Yeah. No, but being a Christian is certainly a creed, right? For certain, for, you know, I think so, anyway. I mean, I suppose if, if you claim the only reason they kicked me off of Facebook is because I said Jesus is Lord, then, then I don't know, then you might have a, you might have a claim but I don't know how many victims of cancel culture would be able to make that kind of argument. Uh, how about the lady over here that uh, has her hand up? Why, thank you. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to ask a question. So, my question is a bit about intent, with censorship being a hot topic. So, I'm going to think of how to word this properly. I had it going through my head. So with censorship, and government, politicians, all these officials who are choosing to pursue these strategies, do you feel that there are dark triad, um, I guess, dimensions that are in line with this, such as narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy? Or do you feel that these politicians genuinely actually have good um, intentions for protections of the citizens? That sounds like a DiLorenzo question to me. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps it is. <laughs> Do, do we think politicians have good intentions when they when they uh, uh, violate the First Amendment? Yeah, that or uh, uh, bad policy. <laughs> yeah. But let's say they have they have totalitarian intentions uh, in, in doing that. Uh, uh, one of Judge Napolitano's speeches, he, he coined the, he didn't coin the phrase, but he uses the phrase uh, libido dominante, which has nothing to do with sex. It's uh, the lust to dominate. And, and, you know, in every, every society has a certain number of people. Our friend Clyde Wilson uh, calls it uh, the Yankee problem in America. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a, a Yankee to Clyde is a, is a group of people who, uh, who are sort of the descendants of the Puritans who believe that they were God's chosen people and have a God-given right to dominate and control everybody else, uh, you know, at gunpoint if necessary, as they did during the Civil War. And so, and we still have those people. Clyde says that uh, Hillary Clinton, in his word, he said, for example, would be a museum quality specimen of such a, a, a thing, a, a Yankee. She, you know, born in Illinois, she went to New England, and, and school in New England, you know, perfect uh, definition. 
And I think that's what motivates people, the libido dominant, the lust to dominate other people. That's, that's what no, uh, motivated Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler, and right on down the line to the, uh, you know, most members of the United States Congress today who, who, who do these things, you know, to some degree, uh, although they're not willing to commit mass murders so far anyway, like, like Stalin and, and Hitler and the rest did. And so um, that's what I see. And as far as what goes on in universities, too, you know, all universities save Grove City are, are government funded. Uh, and maybe Hillsdale. I don't know. I read something Hillsdale may have accepted a penny or two at some point. And so, you know, supposedly the government itself said that the Bill of Rights applies to the states as well as uh, the federal government with uh, the 14th Amendment. And so they're using tax dollars to, to crack down on, uh, on free speech, uh, which they're not supposed to because they receive government money. And so that seems to me, I'm not a constitutional lawyer either, but it seems to me that they're, they're just thumbing their noses at the First Amendment, all of these university presidents and administrators who, who, uh, who do these things uh, and allow these things to happen on their campuses. That's... Can, can I add something to that? I mean, there is some... Uh, you know, in terms of sort of the positive analysis of what motivates different politicians and bureaucrats. I mean, there is some literature on this. Um, Joseph Schumpeter famously argued that, uh, you know, there's sort of a, there's kind of a selection process. So what types of people are more likely to rise through the ranks of government bureaus? What attributes are they more likely to have? Uh, well, he, he pointed out that, these are typically people who are unfamiliar with or uncomfortable with how the market works. And so they're largely ignorant about the world of affairs. You know, look at uh, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, has never had a job of any kind in his, in, in his life. Uh, uh, Hayek Biden. has a chapter, famous chapter in The Road to Serfdom called Why the Worst Get on Top. Or is it How the Worst Get on Top? Yeah, why, why, why the why, worst get on why top. Why the worst get on yeah, top. Yeah. That essentially says, look, here are the characteristics that are, that, that are typically necessary, you know, ruthlessness and willingness to cut moral corners and so forth. So, I mean, we could we could sort of think about rather than just speculate, uh, we could think about well, what 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 is most likely to get somebody in that in in that position, and maybe try to come up with some general principles that would that would suggest. And I think what most of those authors suggest is that it's not. However, someone starts out, I mean, a really well-intentioned person who wants to make the world a better place just is unlikely to survive the rough and tumble of the political process, the bureaucratic process. Mm. They're not going to rise up to the very top of that chain of command. That's why there's one and only one Ron Paul, and, and because of what he just said. Uh, so read, read the chapter of The Road to Serfdom uh, called Why the Worst uh, uh, Rise, to Make It to the Top. And the, the next chapter, or maybe two chapters after that, is called The End of Truth. And, uh, and, it's, and it's why people like this uh, do rise to the top. Now, Hayek wrote this book in the early 40s, and it was, about, uh, it was a warning that if we keep going the way we're, we're going, in, in sort of more and more collectivism, this could happen. That was the 1940s, but we're there now. We're there now, so we're there now where the, the, the worst do rise to the top. He was saying if we keep going in this direction, the worst will rise to the top. But they're all there. Just you know, just open today's newspaper and look at the mugshots of Nancy Pelosi, you know, and all these people, you know, all the rest of them. So I think we're out of time. It's only supposed to be a half hour, right? Uh, okay, and, uh, and so otherwise they're going to have to double our pay. Uh, yeah. Thank you.